Okay, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. And uh, while we start, I'm gonna ask uh, my assistant on this call to start admitting anyone else who hasn't gotten in or as they start coming in to just go ahead and admit them to the uh, Zoom. So uh, good evening and welcome. I wanna thank you all for joining us for our first ever virtual book talk at the Duke University Libraries. I'm Aaron Wellborn, I'm the Library's Director of Communications, and I wanted to say a few words before we get started. Uh, this event was originally supposed to occur face-to-face -face on Duke's campus, and while it was disappointing to change those plans, we were delighted that this virtual format makes it possible for people anywhere and everywhere to attend. So first, a few housekeeping items. In case you just logged in and you're not seeing or hearing yourself, it's because you've all been muted and we've turned off video and screen sharing for all of you. And we also ask that you keep your video turned off. Um, that's just to minimize distractions and make it easier for everyone to hear our speaker tonight. Uh, however, there will be time for Q&A at the end of the program. So if you have questions, please just type them in the chat box as we go, and I'll be moderating that and we'll pass along questions to our speaker. And if you do have a question that you ask in the chat, just be sure to tell us your name in case it's different from your screen name. And if it's relevant, let us know if you have any sort of Duke affiliation. For example, if you're a student or a faculty member or staff member or even a Duke alum. Um, of course, if you're not a Dukie and you're just here because you're interested in the book, that's great too. Uh, we're just trying to get a sense of who's tuning in. And we promise we'll get to as many questions at the end of the program as we can. Uh, this talk is also being recorded. So if you know someone who wanted to be here but couldn't tune in at this time, we're going to be sharing the video on the Duke University Library's YouTube channel and also on our Facebook page once we've had a chance to caption it and upload it. So someone else will be able to watch it later. Finally, this is our first ever attempt at a virtual public event like this, and it's possible there could be some technical difficulties, uh, but we decided we would rather do this imperfectly than not do it at all, given the awesome speaker we have lined up tonight. So thank you in advance for your patience. And now with that business out of the way, I have the privilege of introducing our speaker tonight. So Rachel Lance is a biomedical engineer and blast injury specialist at Duke University. She earned her bachelor's and master's degree in biomedical engineering from the University of Michigan and her PhD in the same field from Duke's Pratt School of Engineering. She specializes in injury biomechanics and she is especially fascinated by the trauma patterns from blast and ballistic events. And that's actually how this book got started. Uh, Dr. Lance had never heard of the Civil War submarine, the H.L. Hunley, until her thesis advisor at Duke casually suggested that she look into it. And that suggestion quickly grew into a pursuit of the mystery that melded her dual passions of history and violent explosions and lasted several years producing three major academic papers, a PhD thesis, and now the book we're gonna hear about tonight. Here in the Duke University Libraries, we're especially pleased to see this book come to fruition, partly because of the way it all started. Two years ago, when Dr. Lance was getting ready to publish her groundbreaking research on the Hunley, she wanted it to be available to as many readers as possible and she approached the library to seek assistance in making her research open access, and we were very happy to help. So in partnership with the provost's office and Duke Schools of Medicine and Nursing, we have a fund that helps authors cover open access publication fees in academic journals so that their work can be freely available online to everyone, not just those who can afford to subscribe to those journals. And because it was published open access, Dr. Lance's research has been widely read and cited and featured in news stories around the world, which just goes to show how research can have a bigger impact when it's not hidden behind a paywall. So 
But that's just one tiny part of this book's fascinating story. In the Waves is Dr. Lance's first book. It was published by Dutton Books earlier this week on Tuesday, April 7th, and it's now available wherever books are sold. For those of you who are Duke students or faculty or staff, we have a number of copies of the ebook and audiobook version of this available through our library website, and we encourage you to check them out. And one day, when this time of social distancing is all over, we'll have print copies you can check out as well. So Dr. Lance wanted me to mention that if there's anyone out there who would like a signed book plate to go with their book, you can visit her website at rachellancewrites.com and use the contact form to submit your name and address. And she will be happy to sign a personal book plate for you and put it in the mail. It's the next best thing to an in-person book signing. And I've put that website in the chat box for you, as well as some instructions for the Q&A tonight. So I'm looking forward to what Dr. Lance has to say, and I know you all are too. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand the mic over to her now. Hi, Erin, thank you. Can you hear me? <laughs> Great. Um, well, as Erin mentioned, we are all here, obviously, to celebrate the anniversary of General Robert E. Lee's surrender, right? Um, no, actually, what happened was we were supposed to have this event in Duke Libraries in person, and obviously, we can't do that right now because there's this viral outbreak going on. When we initially canceled this event, I kind of offered back to Aaron, I'm like, hey, if you guys want to do anything remotely or provide any source of in-home entertainment for people, I think that might be really important coming up because I'm not a virologist, but I am still in recovery from a pretty major knee surgery in early January. So if there's one thing that I am an undisputed expert at, it is staying at home. Uh, so what I know based on my several months of practice in involuntary social isolation is that a lot of these things that I love and that are critical to my happiness day to day, even in normal times, are even more critical now that things are a little bit normal. So I'm really excited to be here tonight in my library at home, which is kind of appropriate because it's where I do all of my writing. So it's where I wrote this book, In the Waves. And it is um, where I get to read a little bit of it to you tonight. All right, so getting started, I want to start with one passage first, um, because this one to me, I put in the book, and I kind of kept it short, but I'm really excited to give it a little bit more context. And then after that, I'll go back and go into the story of the Hanley a little bit more. And this one is important to me because it actually explains why I decided to write this book and why I actually do my job in general. Um, okay. Each major war comes with advances in military technology and fresh young soldiers almost always become the first victims. During the Civil War, the Raines brothers brought mayhem with their inventions of landmines and underwater torpedoes. By World War I, machine guns and high explosives were de deployed to the trenches, rendering cavalry charges obsolete and introducing the first widespread patterns of blast drama. World War II brought submarine wolf packs roaming the seas and atomic bombs, and along with them came innumerable medically novel in water and nuclear blast victims. In Iraq and Afghanistan, the rise in popularity of IEDs caused so many blast-induced traumatic brain injuries that these injuries became known as the quote, signature wound of the conflicts. During peace, militaries seek to prepare for the next war by developing innovative, more effective ways to kill. Then, when the war starts, soldiers are shipped home with different injury types than in the previous wars. Medical scientists and researchers who take a long time to produce answers because of the tedious, exacting nature of scientific research struggle to keep up with the technological advances in weaponry. Blast casualties are uncommon in the civilian world, especially when compared to other traumatic events like car crashes. So the way the field moves forward is usually because the war starts. Soldiers come home wounded or dead. The country wants to know why and decides it is finally willing to fund the science to explain it and to please, oh please, hopefully stop it. 
People like me head to the lab to once again take up our Sisyphean race against the development of new weapons. When the conflicts are over and the dead seem to rest in peace, we are the ones who can be found sifting through the wreckage, still trying to figure out what really happened. So to me, that passage is really important because it explains not just why I love doing what I do. Um, sometimes I get these weird responses from people who are like, oh my gosh, you study violence all day. You just read about explosions all day, people getting shot all day. And I think that's especially accurate, let's be honest. But it's also a little bit of a mischaracterization of my goal because my daily task is to come up with a better safety standard or to come up with a standoff distance or to come up with literally anything that can help the next person from experiencing that same kind of trauma. And that was really brought me to the case of the Hunley is this case was so unique and so unusual that as a blast trauma specialist, when I looked at it, I said, okay, this is something that we have to study because this is novel in our field. Even though it's really old, it was still something unlike anything I'd ever read about in the literature before. It was still completely new. And it doesn't matter to a scientist what race you are or what your goals are or why you were in that boat in the first place. What matters is that we have not physically evolved that much in 150 years. And so, the people in the boat who are hurt, they show patterns of trauma that are still applicable to human beings today. And so no matter what, um, if the, we have these stories from history, and a lot of my cases are from wars because we don't blow people up intentionally. So typically when I get case reports, it's from military action. We can take these traumas, no matter when they occurred or to whom they occurred, and apply learn something new about them, about ourselves, and hopefully turn that into something good and positive. So it's about science. It's not about glamorizing um, combat, but as long as we take these historical stories and we put them in their proper context, then we can really use it to drive some, some new innovations that might benefit people. Um, I think it's also important because this is a story about how science and history really push each other forward. A lot of times they're studied as separate fields and like this is only one example where they really intersect. You, you look at all these great scientific innovations throughout centuries um, of human information and they're always driven forward by a need. So another example I like to use is penicillin. Penicillin was invented shortly before, or discovered shortly before World War II and then the mass production was hugely prioritized when the war started and they realized that they would need this to treat soldiers. So now we have this amazing medical tool that was driven because of the history and the context of what was happening at the time. Um, okay, so a little bit more about the background of the Hunley. A lot of people have a weird reaction when I said that I spent time studying the Civil War submarine. They fall into two camps. One camp says, oh yeah, I've heard about that. That thing is weird. The second camp says, wait a minute, rewind there were Civil War submarines. I think the key to understanding the Hunley and the story of the Hunley is to lower your expectations a bit of what a submarine looked like. So this is the initial days of development. There are earlier submarines before this. There was one used during the American Revolution called the Turtle. But the Civil War is where you really start to see kind of an arms race, where like the Union and the Confederacy are both starting really hard to, um, try to develop this technology into something that is usable for warfare. And of course, they're both pretending they're not doing it right. So both sides are calling these infernal machines, which literally means something straight out of hell, because they think the ethics of this kind of sneak attack tactic is just below gentlemanly warfare. But they're both doing it. The Hunley herself was built uh, by Horace Hunley and his two compatriots, James McClintock and Baxter Watson, and they constructed this thing by hand. So this was actually recycled metal plates that they took from the boiler of an old steamship and they hammered it into shape. So I'm not going to do a lot of screen sharing right now, but I am going to show one image where I'm just going to show this image of the, the Hunley herself. Um, so you guys can see what that looks like. 
And this is the contemporary image. It was drawn in 1863. And it's shown to be, except for the scale of the guy standing next to it, it's been shown to be accurate. So this thing is 40 feet long, and it's roughly four feet in diameter. It's almost cylindrical. And then on the side, it's got these two little dive planes, and that's how it goes up and down. People get in and out through the forward and the aft conning towers. That's the only means of entry and exit. And it's also their only means of getting any kind of fresh gas. It did have a snorkel system, but all of the historical accounts kind of agree it didn't really work very well. And uh, based on my math, it, I agree as well. It doesn't seem to be constructed for proper function. The Huntley was a little bit unique because it attacked with a torpedo, but during the Civil War, that meant something different than it means now. Modern torpedoes are self-propelled. You can set one in the water and aim at something miles away. Whereas in the Civil War, it was more what we'd call a mine or a bomb. It didn't have any of its own propulsion mechanism. The Hunley, off of its bow, had a 16-foot spar. And at the end of that 16-foot spar was where they held their torpedo. Now, this thing, the numbers on the weight are a little bit of a subject of controversy. Personally, I think it was 200 pounds, and the explanation for that is in the book. But either way, it's about the size of a beer keg. So this is about the size of a beer keg. It's attached to a 16-foot pole. They are propelling this submarine by hand. So seven of the crew are inside with an eighth man who's looking out steering, and they crank this thing up to the enemy ship, which is the Union 5th USS Housatonic. They basically jab it in the side with their black powder torpedo, which has a pressure trigger on it. That pressure trigger goes off and the bomb explodes. The Housatonic went down, it hit the bottom of the ocean in less than five minutes. So that's why um, this is considered to be the first successful submarine in combat. And um, that's why it went down in history. But, okay, just stop sharing right now. Um, so what happened was the crew of the Housatonic survived, most of them survived, five of them were killed, but the rest of them scrambled up into the rigging of the ship. So these guys are dangling from these like ropes and sails and cross beams trying to stay above the water because this is February, it's freezing. They don't know how long it'll take for rescue. And one of them sees kind of the Hunley just sitting there. And that was the last time it was ever seen until it was raised in the year 2000. Everybody kind of thought when that would happen, they would see the immediate answer to the mystery and why it sank and why it disappeared. But it only got more complicated from here because when they found it out, they found the crew was inside each of their skeletons not only showed zero signs of trauma, but they were all sitting perfectly at their station. Okay, so some of you may already know that because if you're tuning into this, you probably have at least some interest in the Henley, but I find that it helps to give a little bit of an explanation because I think that context is really important. Um, I, for my testing, did a bunch of live explosive experiments, black powder, with this guy the CSS Tiny, that was a 3 a.m. decision in the lab with a handy bottle of spray paint. Some things just seem really funny at 3 o'clock in the morning when you've been working way too long. Um, but yeah, so it's been useful and now it lives in my garage. But uh, anyway, so I wanted to read you another passage because a lot of people have the very justified reaction of thinking that getting into this tiny submarine seems insane. But the reality is, it's actually worse than that. Um, okay, so serving as crew on the fish boat, it was originally named the fish boat. Um, they renamed it, I'll get to that in a second. Serving as crew on the fish boat came with perks, specifically higher pay and more, no more notoriety about town. The public demonstrations with the little vessel had ensured the crew was well known, especially among the other soldiers and sailors. On one average day, Lieutenant John Payne stood with his head and torso up out of the boat, ready to begin such a demonstration. His crew was waiting for him inside the boat, ready to crank but relaxing for the moment. They were under tow, hatches open, and breathing fresh air with the CSS Etowa doing the work for them until they got to the site of the demonstration. Payne just needed to free the tow line, then lower himself down into the vessel, sealing the conning tower hatch behind him. The plan was the same as the plan for all the previous dog and pony shows. 
dive under some obstacle, resurface on the other side, accept applause from the adoring and hopeful populace who wanted the blockade broken so very badly. So at this point, the Hunley, one of her major goals is to sink one of the Union ships because they are blockading Charleston, South Carolina. This is one of the last major cities standing in the Confederacy and they can't really get any supplies in. So a lot of them are experiencing not just equipment shortages, but food shortages as well. Rocky waves were making the job difficult, however, and the tow line was a disaster. Payne struggled trying to free himself from the line, but he slipped. Jammed partly inside the conning tower, but still partly outside the hatch, his legs scrabbling for purchase accidentally knocked the long lever that controlled dive blades. The narrow fins on the port and starboard sides angled in response, and the fish boat dove. The submarine sank, unsealed, beneath the surface. Water began to pour in through the open conning tower hatches. Payne managed to get himself fully out via the four conning tower and crewman William Robinson squeezed out of the conning tower near the stern. In order to escape the flooding metal cylinder, the men in the middle would need to slither through a deadly obstacle course. The twisting, circuitous pipes of the crank formed a broad spiral down the starboard side of the four foot wide tube and the long pine crew bench shrank the available vertical space on the port. Each man was wedged in place, head and shoulders slouched to fit in the narrow hull, with his legs crammed between the bench and the crank, his arms pressed between the shoulders of his neighbors. The tiny dead lights overhead let in some sun, but the small circles of imperfect old-fashioned glass could only dimly light the interior of the trap. To escape, each man would need to keep calm in the dark, keep his head above the rapidly rising water, thread between the crank and the bench, stay hunched over inside the narrow hull, avoid the ballast blocks placed throughout the bilge, and find his way to the small target of a conning tower. Even then, they could only exit one at a time, unable to begin the process before their neighbors gave them space to move. Meanwhile, the ocean kept gushing in as the boat continued to plummet. Okay, so five men couldn't make it. They dived wedged in the jam-packed labyrinth between the bench and the crank. When the submarine was recovered, their corpses were so swollen and so offensive from their days in the warm summer seawater that they needed to be dismembered before they could be removed in pieces through the narrow ovals of the conning towers they had been trying to reach. Some accounts differ in the details, stating that instead a wave swamped the open hatch door, but these accounts are generally suspected to be polite alterations of the truth to spare Payne's pride. Whatever the true cause of the flooding, Lieutenant Payne was required to arrange for the purchase of coffins for his drowned crew and to write a letter to his superior officer justifying the expense of extra large sizes to fit the bloated bodies. So that is definitely one of the more graphic passages in the book. Um, I will warn you, I don't go into too much extreme detail about a lot of the goriness, but I think it's really important to include that historical testimony because that's what these people were signing up for. That was the first time this boat sank. They had built previous prototypes, those sank in practice, and then the second time that it sank, Horace Hudley, one of the inventors, was inside. He was recovered in the fore conning tower with his right hand raised above his head trying to bash his way out the conning tower hatch, and after that, uh, they renamed the boat in his honor. So that's how it actually got the name the H.L. Henley. And I think that's really important when you're thinking about the motivation. So when you're, a lot of what I did with this book was not necessarily try to justify anything, but to try and recognize that these were human beings and they got in this situation in the first place because of normal human realities. I think it's really easy to paint everyone with a paintbrush that just says, oh, well, they were evil, they wanted slaves which if you're looking for a lost cause book, this isn't it. Um, I don't really cover up my feelings about the fact that the Civil War was heavily related to slavery, but I think it's also important to recognize that you can't just say, oh, well, you know, all the millions of people that were there were fighting specifically for the same reason. So I really tried to get into what each person, as far as we could tell, like what each person was doing and what their motivations were and what put them in this boat, despite the fact that two, two other crews had already died in it. Um, so I think that's really important. One of the things I wanted to do tonight is uh, kind of touch on each of the three different story arcs that there are going on in this book. One of them is my personal story, which is what it's like to be a scientist doing these experiments, what some of those trials are like, 
The second one is the history aspect of it, which is pretty obvious. Like you can't tell the story of this boat without literally telling the story of this boat. But the third one is the story of the science. And that was by far my favorite part to write. I got really excited whenever I got to a chapter that was all science. Um, my agent could probably tell you I would start emailing her a lot more. <laughs> like, Laura, guess what I got to do today? But um, anyway, those are my favorite parts because that's the part that I just truly love. And that's the part that drives me is being able to use this science to explain something. So that's the kind of last passage that I want to read to you. And it's, um, it's one of my favorites. So, okay. The strongest bone in the human body is the femur, a singular massive column of osseous tissue that acts as the infrastructure of the thigh. When the femur grows, it can increase in diameter all around the outside of the bone, but it can only extend in length through the creation of new growth, at new tissue at the growth plates. A growth plate is located at each end of the femur, one near the hip and another near the knee. During puberty, these plates turn out cartilage, which then gets slowly replaced by other cells and minerals like calcium, as it is built in a solid bone, gradually extruding the entire femur by lengthening the central portion. As the new tissue extends from the growth plate, the bone organizes itself into lines, forming thin fiber structures reminiscent of the threads of a steel cable. These fibers are called osteons, and the central portion of the long bone looks like a tightly bound bundle of their lines, a bamboo stalk with a hollow marrow-filled core. By the end of puberty, the general linear structure of these osteons has more or less been set for life. The exception is injury. A fracture to a long bone like the femur disrupts the even smooth tendrils of the fibrous bundle, splitting osteons apart from one another and cleaving them into pieces. Like wood, the tissue wants to split along the direction of the fibers, and as a result, the fracture usually propagates away from the original site of the blow. The bone gets disrupted into jagged shards. The middle bone of my right pinky finger is broken as I write this. It has been reset and will heal, but long after my death, a trained eye will be able to look at the bone and see the old brain. The bone will always bear a line of chaotic osteons wrapped around its middle in a thin spiral, indicated that it had once twisted apart. If the victim is not lucky, the pieces of bone break apart from the trauma and they float isolated within the soft tissue of the surrounding muscles. Too far apart and they cannot sew themselves back together. In the 21st century, surgeons can manually reassemble the pieces using cadaver bone and metal parts to fill in the gaps in the structure and to provide support to join the broken elements together. But they do so while wearing masks and sterile gloves to thwart the legions of marauding bacteria that would happily grab a foothold and grow the exposed flesh. Despite antibiotics and sterile techniques, infection is still a constant concern. In the time of the Hunley, bacteria ran amok. Louis Pasteur, one of the main advocates, convinced the scientific community that bacteria existed, did not present the results of his first experiments until the same month as Dixon's wound at the Battle of Shiloh. Okay. So Dixon is the pilot of the, the ship. So that becomes really important because the femur of the skeleton seated at the pilot station showed signs of trauma. The lines of osteons running the length of the bone were disrupted, a scar that revealed that at some point the upper part of the femur had experienced a comparatively minor trauma that had healed on its own. Tiny flecks of blood stayed embedded in the bone. It was damaged consistent with a gunshot wound. The man had been lucky. Shards of his femur had not split apart inside his upper thigh because something else had absorbed the bulk of the impact of the bullet. He had not needed to risk the horrors of 1860 surgical techniques because something else had dispersed enough of a force to let the bone stay largely intact. More than likely, that something else was the warped gold count coin inscribed GED that was found in his pocket. So that's one of the coolest parts about the recovery of the Henley, I think, is that when they were excavating it, they kind of confirmed this major legend that the pilot of the craft was Lieutenant George Dixon, and he had been rumored to have been shot in the thigh at the Battle of Shiloh. And the rumor said that a $20 gold piece that he happened to have in his pocket absorbed the impact of the bullet and saved his life. Because at that time, that was a really recoverable wound. You either ended up with a shattered femur, which meant amputation, or you ended up with gangrene, which meant amputation. 
for an upper upper femur injury that would have been really complicated by 1860 standards to perform the amputation correctly while saving his life. Um, so that was one of the cool things that ended up turning out to be true was when they recovered it, they found the warp pull coin in the pocket of the person at the captain's station with the inscription of George Dixon's in initials, as well as the words Shiloh and my life preserver. All right, um, so now that we've talked about the Hunley for quite a bit and read quite a bit, I think this is probably a good time to open things for questions. So this is Aaron again. I'm just gonna remind people if you just tuned in a little while ago, if you have questions for Rachel, just type them in the chat box and we will relay them to her. No one else will be able to see what you write in the chat box except the hosts. Uh, but we will pass along your questions. And I know it sometimes takes people a little while to type. So, so we'll get one thing I want to mention too is um, we've talked about book plates before. I'm not sure exactly how many I will get. So I'm happy to honor as many requests as I can, but you know, it's kind of a wild supplies elastic situation. But for people who are watching this as a recording, um, I am always happy to have conversations about science. So my website does have a contact form that's rachellancewrites.com. Um, but I will warn you, I am a female on the internet. So sometimes I get undesirable emails and I do turn those into data points that will eventually be an academic paper on uh, internet conversations. So don't be a data point. So Rachel, we have a question here from Bruce Roberts. Okay. If if the Hunley's armed spar was longer and or positioned at a different angle, could that have resulted in a different outcome? Yes. So this is the reason we haven't seen this pattern of trauma before is because this is kind of your perfect storm blast scenario. There are so many variables that they could have changed even slightly and they probably would have survived. So based on my testing, that angle of the arm spar was actually really important into the way that the blast transmitted inside the submarine. And um, I do think if it had been more straight or if it had been longer, then they would have had a really good chance of surviving. That's great. So thanks for the question, Bruce. We have another question here from Aaron Sager. Dr. Lance, how many years did you spend researching the Hunley? <laughs> well, um, I think I need to qualify that answer. So when I was a PhD student researching it, I worked on it for three straight years. And then once I graduated, I really continued that project. So I didn't start writing my final paper until after I'd already graduated, I defended my PhD. Um, between that and then I continued some of the archival work to flesh out the story for this book. Like I had never had a reason to look into the motivations of the crew before. Um, but yeah, so in total, it's been about seven years, I would say. And uh, a lot of that as a grad student, some people may already know you work some really extreme hours. So we might need to expand that out and do like a dog years kind of calculation. <laughs> Thank you for your question, Aaron. So we have another question here from Tom Hadzer. What are you researching now? And is it going to lead to another book? Ooh, yes and no. Um, okay, so I do work part-time uh, as a research professor at Duke. I work out of the hyperbaric chamber there and I work on undersea and hyperbaric physiology. So generally what I do is kind of seeing how people survive underwater, sometimes work with high altitude or outer space. Um, basically, I really like seeing what happens to the human body when people are places they shouldn't be. But my current project that I'm trying to wrap up is a safety device. Um, we had um, a diver who died working on one of my projects before I came to Duke when I was still working on base with the Navy. And he died from what is the most common cause of death for divers using that particular piece of equipment. Um, it's called a rebreather. It's the second most fatal activity in the world by man hours after base jumping. So my current project is wrapping that up. So it turned out my idea was a really viable safety, safety device and it's cheap and it's easy to use. And um, yeah, hopefully that'll turn into a product that people can actually use one day and be a little safer. And I don't think that that will directly lead to a book. 
Um, but I am working on a next book idea. I'm not ready to talk about it too much yet because it's not fully finalized, but you should expect another kind of genre blending of science and history. Okay, we have another question here for you from Renee Strauss. Uh, what can we expect in the future from you? This might be related to the question you were just answering. And I would be particularly interested in further studies in the Great Lakes. <laughs> Renee is biased there because I know her in real life and that's where she lives. <laughs> and, uh, I'm originally from Detroit. So a um, lot of friends in the Great Lakes love the Great Lakes, used to dive in them. But um, I'm actually really happy where I am right now, which is kind of disorienting. I don't know a lot of people who can necessarily say that, but I love the current balance I have of science and then kind of the arts and the way that I get to integrate them together. So for the foreseeable future, I'm just gonna keep doing what I'm doing. I'm really hopeful that NASA will fund me to do some experiments looking at missions to Mars. But aside from that and project hopes, um, I'm gonna keep keep with the research and the writing. Okay, we've got another question here from Manisha. Uh, says, your work is inspiring. What surprised you about writing a book that was different from writing your PhD thesis? Ooh, good question. Um, okay, so first of all, with the book, you get the opportunity to put a little bit more of your heart and soul in it. When you're doing scientific writing, it's almost, it's almost a contest to see how objective and emotionally removed you can make it because that's what makes for good science, right? Science has absolutely no place with feelings. Like they're completely removed. Obviously we can be motivated to do science by feelings, but when we report it, we want data, we want statistics, we want results. Whereas with the book, I think I got a lot more of an opportunity to kind of let my own passion for the subject run free a little bit. So there are some passages in there where I'm talking about blasts or where I'm talking about injuries or physiology where um, at least I hope like my genuine enthusiasm for the subject comes across a lot more than it does when you read my scientific writing, which is much more dry. All right, we have another question here from Ron. Can you share anything about your new contribution to international weights and measures, the quote unquote, Rachel? <laughs> oh man, um, so someone read the Wired excerpt. <laughs> there is an excerpt in Wired Magazine that has one of my favorite uh, passages from the book where I got the opportunity to fulfill a lifelong goal and use myself as a unit of measurement. Um, so that's in there. I think it's chapter three. But um, yes, yeah, so I redefine uh, weight and force as a unit of Rachel. Now, it has been pointed out to me that units are not supposed to be capitalized, and I capitalized my name in the book. So obviously, I sincerely apologize to all of those in the units and standards world who I'm offended. And I am working post haste on a legal name change to remove the capitalization so I will match the appropriate standards. Nice. So I'm going to give people about one more minute or, or 30 seconds or so if there's any final questions. But these have been some great questions so far. I think I'm seeing some too. There are a couple. Okay. Uh, here's another question from Ashley. How hard was it to untangle the rope for the experiments? <laughs> Ashley is asking a leading question because she is the person that helped me do that. Um, so I'm actually really glad you asked this though, because even though it's specific and she is in the acknowledgements for that, um, it was a major contribution. I really needed that rope back. But uh, it's really a good emphasis for how literally no project in the history of science has ever been done by a person working by themselves. Uh, I worked really hard at trying to acknowledge as many people as possible in the book, but 
you reach a point where you're bringing in too many names. Like it, can, it gets really confusing with all the new people if you just pop up once and then disappear. So I did do a more exhaustive listing in the acknowledgements in the back, but basically I owe all of them forever. And you can't do anything by yourself alone. If it had just been me trying to do this by myself, I would have just been a sad PhD student sitting in a mud puddle. So here's another question from Noel Gorham. How did you first hear about the Hunley? I had actually never heard of it before. Um, my advisor is, or my former PhD advisor is a big history buff, as am I. And I had already been working on cases of sailors who had been in the water and who had been blasted during World War II. So like I mentioned, it's obviously really unethical to blow people up on purpose. So a lot of the cases that we find are kind of scraped and scavenged out of history. And he has this mannerism of just walking into an office and starting in the middle of the conversation. Like he doesn't really waste time um, with a lot of the chit chat, which personally I think is pretty nice. But um, so he just kind of wandered into my office one day and he sat down and he said, what about the Hunley? He was just looking at me, that was it. What about the Hunley? And I had absolutely no idea what he's talking about, but I was a grad student, so I just agreed and then Googled it later. That's how it all started. Okay, here we have another question from Katie Glass. She says, I'm also a Duke uh, biomedical engineering PhD grad. I'm wondering how collaborative this project is. Who did you work with and how did they help you? This project was really collaborative, but in a really surprising and new way. Typically, one of the things that I love about Duke is the amount of resources that we have on campus. I've kind of compared it to a toy store before. Um, and that's true if you're a huge nerd. But um, this project was really unique because I needed resources that we didn't have for the first time. And so I collaborated with the ATF, which is the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. Um, I also collaborated with one of the medical students. So Duke sends their medical students out into labs to do scientific research for their third year of school. And that turned out to be really key for me because this particular medical student was a former Army Explosives Ordnance Disposal Specialist. So he also helped me ensure I kept all of my fingers and toes. Um, and, but that was a really neat opportunity to collaborate with the medical school. So at that time, I had already been sort of having conversations with them about working on a project at, out of hyperbarics, which is where I am now. And I had already had relationships with them. So they were really involved in a lot of the calculations with gas supply and things like that. Um, and yeah, and then there was also a collaboration with the tobacco farmer, which is something I would have never expected, but I needed a body of water where I could legally blow things up. And it turned out the best way to do that was to find private property. Um, so this project is kind of just like a random hodgepodge of history enthusiasts who were really willing to donate their time. And then um, there were also some blast experts who were extremely helpful in kind of being my sounding boards as well as talking through a lot of the principles of blast physics, um, who were other Navy civil servants. At that time, I was working as a civil servant for the Navy, and they were working out of a different base, but looking at uh, ships instead of people. So they're pretty great too. So yeah, it was hugely collaborative. It was just in a different way than I would normally expect. So here's another question from Gary McCormick. Do you foresee any future work involving submarines? Well, first of all, um, submarines. And you can't see them, but I am wearing submarine gym shorts as well. And uh, they're one of my favorite things in the world. So I think the next book will have some possible maybe submarines in it. Um, we're still figuring out the details of that. But in general, since I live in the world of undersea and hyperbaric research, the submarine community is one of the communities that I work with a lot. Like we do a lot of our medical research on their behalf or working directly with them. So submarines will always be a huge part of my life. Um, they've been a passion of mine for forever. Don't ask me why, I genuinely don't know. I just love them, I find them fascinating. Um, so I'm hopeful that they'll be part of everything I do in the future, but we'll see the degree to which that is actually possible. 
So here's another question from Nikki. What was one of your coolest or unexpected moments when quote unquote diving into the archives? Oh man. Um, so archive work is really fascinating because I, it's like, it's like playing a slot machine. You can have days where literally nothing happens and you are just staring at stuff for days on end. But then all of a sudden you turn the right page and you win the lottery. And so I think that that's why it's really addictive to certain personality types. Um, I can be very obsessive about stuff. And so I'm willing to kind of let that loose in the right circumstances and go through these papers. So one of my favorite moments with the archives was um, there had been this diagram of the Hummus torpedo and the people that originally found it were refusing to cite it anywhere, which people in science will know is extremely atypical. Like this is very, very unusual behavior. Generally, you're extremely specific. Here's where I found this. Here's the date I copied it. Here's the pants that I was wearing at the time. Like, um, you know, and they want to make sure that it's all there. So the fact that they were not citing that made me wonder what the context of it was. And so that actually took a lot of work. I had to take a couple trips to go find that diagram, but I did. And um, so turning the page and finding that was really, really exciting. And I definitely, it was a library, so it was a very quiet and appropriate celebration, but I definitely texted a lot of people about it immediately. <laughs> so. so here's another question from Kevin Rumsey. Being a Civil War enthusiast, how would a student or an avid reader of the time period enjoy this book? Oh my gosh, I really hope everyone enjoys this book, to be honest. Um, there's a lot of Civil War history in here. There's a mixture of history and science. Like I said, this one was really difficult to classify. We actually had a bunch of conversations about which category was most appropriate. Um, but the science is driven by the history. So the reason that I did all of these miscellaneous and like seemingly otherwise unrelated things is all because, um, because of the history of the Civil War and because of what was going on at that time. So I, I really hope that you enjoy it. Um, there is some stuff in there that personally I was really excited about. I could have gone on about for a long time. Like for example, there's quite a bit about the Rains brothers and the development of black powder, which I promise is way more fascinating than it sounds because it involves bat guano and home experimentation. Um, and that's what they were doing at the time to equip their military. So I'm really hopeful that bringing out some of these aspects, which are technically chemistry and looking at the chemistry of the black powder will be a little bit of a first for a Civil War book as well, but they're still relevant to this time period. So here's another question from Mike Katz. Do you see yourself building a full scale working recreation of the Hunley ever? Oh, if I do that, something in my life has gone terribly awry. <laughs> I really, really hope to never ever do that. <laughs> so I'm gonna give people maybe a couple more seconds to add questions to the chat. While we're waiting on that, I just want to remind everyone in the chat right now, we have Rachel's website where you can go and use the contact form to request a personalized book plate if you want one. And also, if you ever wish to uh, follow the Duke University Libraries online, I've put our social media uh, addresses in there for you. Yeah, that's actually something I'd like to touch on before. I know you talked on the co-funding, but that was really important to me to be able to make this research publicly accessible. So anyone can read this paper if you want the academic paper. Um, anyone can look at the data. But on top of this too, this was my first project where I'd really feel like I'd fully utilize the libraries. Um, if you're struggling with a history project, just ask a librarian because the list of documents that the librarians at Duke were able to get for me is insane. I probably owe them all many gift baskets. Um, but I really had, even though I've always been a reader and I've always been a fan of libraries, I'd really underestimated the research capabilities that they could help you with. Well, we'll come collect that gift basket at a later date. Yeah. 
in a few months. <laughs> Well, it looks like that's all the questions we have for tonight, and that's pretty close to time for this evening. So I just want to uh, reiterate and, and say thank you to Rachel for spending time with us this evening, and thank you to all of you who tuned in. We really appreciate it. Um, if you're using Zoom, you can probably see down in uh, your toolbar the little uh, reactions uh, emoji you can offer a little clap if you want for rachel up in your uh, oh gosh <laughs> uh, there we have a little round of applause going oh on. thanks guys <laughs> thank you so. uh, uh, thanks again rachel and thanks to all of you for joining us tonight we really appreciate it yeah thanks for tuning in and thanks to duke for providing this um like i said i think figure out ways to distract ourselves and read and engage your brains aside from Netflix is really key to surviving being at home. So well, that seems like a great note to end on. Thanks again, Rachel. And we're, we'll go ahead and end the meeting. And as a reminder, uh, this was recorded and we're going to be sharing it on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook page as soon as we have a chance to upload the recording. So if you know someone who really wanted to be here tonight and tune in, let them know that and we'll be happy to share that recording with them. All right. Take care, everyone. And thanks again, Rachel. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.